All right, so descriptive linguistics talks about kind of the components of language, the sounds, the words, the uh, rules of putting things together. So we, uh, linguists or linguistic anthropologists divide language into th structure into three levels. Phonology, which is the study of the actual speech sounds that are present. Morphology, which is the way in which those speech bound, uh, sounds are put together to make meaningful words. And then syntax, which is the way in which those words are put together to make meaningful sentences or ideas. All languages have predictable phonological, morphological, and syntactic structures. Now, not all languages use the same, right? But generally, closely related languages will use closely related um, structures. So we start with phonology, uh, the actual sounds that are present in languages. There are a lot of things that we have to have intricate control of and we have to combine to be able to make meaningful sounds. We've got our glottis, um, which is kind of this part at the back of the throat, the flap that kind of controls uh, swallowing versus um, speech. We have our tongue movements and we're not just talking about you know, where the tip of your tongue is, but whole tongue movements. We actually move our palate as we speak, which is one of the reasons why um, orthodontists are starting to use braces and palate extenders earlier and earlier because the conditions in our mouth are uh, related not only to um, like eating and, and our having room for our teeth to grow and such, but also related to speech. And so sometimes kids can have speech impediments because they have a narrow palate, for example, and a palate expander uh, used by an orthodontist um, with or without corresponding like actual brackets on teeth can help to then alleviate some of those speech problems as well. We use our teeth, we use our lips, we use many other parts. We've got our larynx that opens into the pharynx, right? We've got the, our actual vocal cords and how tight they are and uh, whether they have nodes on them or not, et cetera. So all of these have to work in tandem to be able to utter the simplest words and sentences. <clears throat> Linguistic anthropologists who study phonology, they catalog its meaningful sounds by identifying what we call minimal pairs or pairs of words that differ only in a single sound contrast. What we're actually specifically identifying are something called phonemes, P-H-O-N-E-M-E-S, okay? Phonemes are the basic sounds that are present, present and significant in a specific language. Um, so when we talk about minimal sound contrasts, we might compare words like pat and bat. Um, pat and bat mean very different things. So we would say that p, p and b, b are distinct sounds within the English language. Um, cup and cap, bit and butt. I mean, it doesn't really, um, it, it could be, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be the starting um, pad and pat. It doesn't have to be the starting sound. doesn't have to be the vowel sound. It can be any component of uh, all of the sounds that are strung together in those words. So P and B are called stops because there has to be a stoppage of airflow for us to make these sounds. Vowel sounds can be held continuously. There's no stop. So we have both continuous and stop sounds. Um, to be able to make P or B, you have to actually stop that sound. You have to actually physically restrict the air movement um, to be able to develop that meaningful difference. Linguists also use similar characteristics of sounds to classify every sound in a given languages or in a given language. So many sounds that are used by other languages don't in occur in English. So when you see Southern African languages, specifically the Hoitzon family of language, um, you see exclamation points in the words. We might watch a film later called Nai Story of a Kung Woman, and it's N um, exclamation point AI. And that stands for, the exclamation point stands for that, that click that is used in that language. Uh, we recognize in Spanish a difference between N, N and Ña, right? Uh, that having the tilde over the N changes the 
uh, way that it's pronounced. We recognize also the difference between a single L and the double L, um, like tortilla, right? It's not tortilla. Um, so in, in German, it's the umlaut that makes U and U pronounced differently. So we've got a lot of those nuances, a lot of those, uh, a lot of symbols that are used in foreign languages that are not used in English. <clears throat> with sound differences, with phonological differences, we also find uh, regional dialects. So prior to the 1970s, linguists assumed that American English would become increasingly homogeneous, meaning that because people were moving uh, between areas um, that, and because we had the spread of mass media, that we would develop a standard unaccented English. Now, if any of you are, have traveled um, to other regions of the world or to the other regions of the US, you recognize that that is not the case, right? Uh, and instead we still see distinct regional dialects. So, you know, look here in the orange, right? What part of the world would you call the orange? Well. That's the South. Um, and typically in the South, words have extra syllables. The sound is drawn out. So my, my parents talk about hearing those sirens on those ambulances, right? Um, that's not how we would say it here in New Mexico. Um, just even the y'all, right? Y'all come back now, you hear, right? We can say things in very different ways. And we tend to also subscribe social capital to the different dialects. Um, in the Boston area, um, we talk about people saying ka instead of car, right? Um, in the Midwest, um, you've got, I'm trying to think of what, what it is. There was a stereotype for the Midwest and now I'm just totally spacing on it. Um, out in the West, particularly in some regions of California, we had Valley Girl speak. Uh, along southern Canada, it's it's things like a boot, right? A boot instead of about, and ending your sentences with a. Um, so we see an even greater distinction um, between the ways that people say things. So these regional dialects and sound changes that are between generations within communities are greater than ever. We're seeing an increasing differentiation of uh, the dialects and, and the way that sounds are produced in those dialects. This suggests that despite media homogenization, peer groups play a much stronger role in the transmission of linguistic forms. And so we're looking to people who are in the area where we live to help us figure out how we say things, what sounds are important, etc. So uh, if you've seen the videos of how Burkinias speak, for example, right, there's a distinctive dialect of English slash Spanglish uh, here in Albuquerque that's different from the way that people speak in northern New Mexico. So this isn't limited to these vast uh, regions across the U.S., but even just looking at uh, in individual states and how things are pronounced differently uh, across different states. So dialects are stronger than ever. Basically, people seek to differentiate into, they use language as part of the way that they recognize in-group versus out-group. Um, so you, people who speak like you are quote-unquote like you. This ties back into that ethnocentrism versus cultural relativism discussion from week one, right? Um, People who are like you are uh, are friends, are collaborators. People who are different from you are quote unquote other, and you seek to actively exclude them or push them away. We also, within descriptive linguistics, seek grammar norms. Grammatical elements that are learned in one cultural context can feel natural and normal to a ma native speaker but can be very illogical to speakers of other languages. One of the things about German is that ah, they just smash their words together. Um, some of the longest words that I've ever tried to speak are German words where you end up getting a whole sentence basically um, in a single word. Um, if we think about English and Spanish, we can just talk about gender markings, right? We don't gender our nouns in English. You have a or the, uh, you don't have la or l, right? So um, Spanish does gender nouns. Um, German genders nouns, but has feminine, masculine, and neutral. Um, 
so there are languages that are very closely related to us and even occur in close proximity to us that have features in the grammatical structure uh, that are foreign to us. I, when I was first learning German, um, I always got my qualifier wrong. I always got, so I, I would mix up D, Dare, and Das, and I was trying to figure out uh, which words, which nouns are masculine versus feminine versus neutral. So that took quite some time to figure out, and I still make mistakes. Um, thankfully, that's like one of the smaller mistakes that I make. But, you know, as, as kids are learning German, they're learning those gender of their nouns as they learn the words themselves, and that, that gets reinforced through the speech that they're hearing, etc. Um, one of the other rules that can be different is... Uh, you know, do you go subject, verb, object, right? Do you, how do you structure your sentence? Um, Spanish is pretty similar in terms of how we structure Spanish and English, but German often puts all of the adjectives and then ends with the verb. Um, so we can see differences <clears throat> across languages. So for German, it would be um, subject, object, uh, verb. Um, so we can see differences in how these grammar rules apply. Um, this, the variety that we find in languages across the world can be pretty amazing. There are uh, three tenses in English, right? There's present, past, and future tense. Uh, the uh, Ninjaram language of Papua New Guinea has five tenses. Indonesian has no regular tense markings. So uh, when you speak in Indonesian, you don't have to conjugate verbs. That's, that can be pretty nice, right? Um, and that's because there, you don't have distinct forms of verbs that correspond with distinct sentences. Uh, we'll talk about this in specifically an example comparing English to Hopi um, in a few slides. But um, does this carry over to different ways of structuring the world? That's just that little tidbit that I want you to start thinking about as we move forward. In English, the pronoun you may refer to one person or many people. French, we see informal tu and formal vous. The Awan language of Papua New Guinea includes equivalents of you, one person, you, two people, and you, more than two people. You know, in Spanish, it's you and it's, it's tu and usted, right? Um, in German, we've got, again, different words for, well, not really, I mean, it's du and z uh, for you and then kind of all of them. So these grammar rules don't just apply to sentence structure, they also apply to conjugating verbs, they also apply to the pronouns that are used in particular contexts. All right, so that brings us to sociolinguistics. Sociolinguists study how social context and cultural norms shape language use in a linguistic community. And so specifically, they're looking at how language is used rather than prescribing how language should be used. All right, that's what you get in your language arts classes is how you should use language. Sociolinguists study what people actually do. Uh, and so we can focus on signs, symbols, and metaphors. Um, signs are the most basic way of conveying simple meaning. For example, we've got stop signs that are always read are always octagons, and then of course the writing stop is uh, always bright white. We get a dramatic attention getting color. <clears throat> Symbols are elaborations on signs that often have a wider range of meaning. So uh, summarizing symbols for the US might include the American flag. What does it symbolize? It symbolizes freedom, it symbolizes democracy free enterprise, hard work, competition, progress, individualism, etc. cetera. Um, and <clears throat> so we talk about those core kind of cultural values that are tied into particular symbols. We also can have elaborating symbols. Um, these are things that serve like the cow among the Nuer and Dinka. These are pastoralist populations in the South Sudan. Um, cows symbolize food that, uh, because you can both eat them in terms of eating their flesh, but you can also use their products that they produce, dairy products, specifically dairy and milk are the big things used by pastoral populations. Um, also can be used as food without actually killing your cow. Uh, but cows are also wealth. Um, they also use cows as a symbol of society and its parts of society. And so um, 
you know, there are, there's mythology, religious mythology tied to cows. I mean, the cow as a symbol is used in every aspect of their culture. Key scenarios, these imply how people should act. So an American key scenario is the Horatio Alger myth. The idea that you can go from rags to riches, that if you just do hard work and perseverance, you will be successful. You will achieve the quote unquote American dream. <clears throat> Metaphors come from the Latin word metaphora or carrying over. These are comparisons <clears throat> that emphasize the similarities between things. Often this can involve a physical action in a more abstract sense. She rose to the challenge and lifted the spirits of those around her. Is she really rising? No, she's metaphorically rising. Is she really lifting something? No, it's not like weightlifting, right? Um, so we can take words that are distinct action words and we can apply them in more of an abstract, conceptual, metaphorical way. Um, language makes use of all of these. Language uses signs, it uses symbols, it uses metaphors to continually reinforce these cultural values in the community. <clears throat> so take a moment and think about um, how we might use metaphors and symbols in our daily language, how that allows us to frame important issues in more or less appealing ways. So for example, we've faced an economic downturn with the pandemic, right? A lot of people have lost their jobs. Well, sometimes uh, losing your job is rephrased as downsizing rather than firing, right? Or furloughs versus firing. Um, that we can change the ways that we frame that language in order to uh, have it come across with different kind of social meaning. Language though also has the potential to shape how we experience the world. And so within sociolinguistics, there have historically been two competing thoughts. One is the Noam Chomsky point of view where we all have universal basic grammar um, and we don't necessarily see as big an active role of culture changing language or language changing culture. Rather, we use a defined evolved set of universal rules and language has to fit within that structure. <clears throat> By contrast, we have something called the Sapir Whorf hypothesis that states that language molds or shapes or even limits thought. And so we can look at uh, how language is utilized to determine how people think. So in the 1920s, uh, linguistic anthropologist Edward Sapir um, first proposed this idea that languages incline its speakers to think about the world in certain ways because of specific grammatical categories. Um, we call this linguistic relativity. Um, and Benjamin Lee Whorf then in the 1950s expanded on Sapir's work. That is why it's called the sapir whorf hypothesis. Uh, and he specifically looked at the Hopi uh, and came up with this idea of what we call linguistic determinism. That is that the features of language determine how people think. So language therefore determines culture rather than vice versa or rather than a bi-directional process. Um, looking at the Hopi, the Hopi language has only two tenses. English, of course, has past, present, and future. Hopi has past and present combined into one. Um, specifically, the Hopi talk about that which is occurring or has ever occurred. That is combining past and present. And then the other tense is that which has not occurred. Uh, Worf thought that because the Hopi don't linguistically distinguish between past and present, that they don't structure the world that way, that they don't think of past events having happened in the past, rather than um, that something that's existing or has ever existed, it's all the same to them, it's all currently existing. Um, there's disagreement over how Worf interpreted the Hopi, other linguists have studied the Hopi and recognized that there are some nuances um, that maybe not distinct verb tenses, but ways that they structure their phrases to uh, be able to make some of these distinctions. But most anthropologists accept a weak version of linguistic relativity. So what does that mean? Um, 
that means that language can par can partially limit how you think, but not wholly limit how you think. So um, you can be exposed to new ideas and new ways of thought. You can be exposed to new language and you can kind of open your uh, your mind and, and expand how you conceptualize the world. Uh, Worf argued that or suggested that translating Hopi into English would fundamentally alter its meaning because we wouldn't be able to know based on what the Hopi were saying, whether they were talking about past events or current events. In reality, um, language, while it can mold thought and determine, at least in part, the direction or the ways in which cult people in a specific culture think about the world, it doesn't wholly determine thought. Um, and indeed, culture changes, cultural changes often drive linguistic changes. So think about technology from the 1950s, right? We've had a dramatic change in uh, the role that technology plays in our lives that has necessitated a linguistic change as well. Now we can go Google something and that has meaning to us. In the 1950s, telling someone to go Google, nobody would understand what you meant, right? A Google was a one with a hundred zeros after it spelled differently. Um, but yeah, there wasn't this idea of using an electronic device in a search engine to be able to uh, to find something on the internet. So uh, language and culture can both change really rapidly and it doesn't have to be one preceding the other. It's really this bi-directional kind of flow or relationship. All right, so <clears throat> ethnoscience and color terms. Um, you know, people frame the world differently based on um, their other cultural features, right? Our linguistic terms um, are reinforced by and mold and shape and also are shaped by other aspects of our culture. So um, ethnoscience uh, has a specific relationship with color terms because those colors become relative to the rest of our culture. Uh, so Berlin and Kay in the late 1960s analyzed the color terms of more than 100 languages and found that basic color terms are consistent across language. Speakers of vastly different languages didn't appear to perceive colors differently. They just classified them differently. So for example, we've got uh, this kind of four quadrant uh, sort of structure here that we've got things that are white or light, red or reddish, black or dark, and um, you know, the other side also being red or reddish. So what's an example of different color terms? Well, there's a color in the Crayola box that was the color that I always used to color skin tones when I was growing up. Now, remember, I grew up in a world where uh, we really only had blacks and whites. We didn't have um, people of Hispanic origin, et cetera, um, Native Americans really like in the uh, area that we grew up. So we didn't have all the in-betweens. Um, now Crayola is selling uh, boxes of crayons and markers that are skin colors that have as many as 20 different like color options. And I think that's fantastic. But growing up, you could use brown or you could use this other color um, that because of the area of the world where I grew up, it's called peach, right? Why was it peach? Well, because Virginia was very close to South Carolina and Georgia. South Carolina and Georgia are both known for their peaches. Therefore, that specific color was always called peach in my crown box and in my life. That same color in the Pacific Northwest is called salmon, right? Uh, we also have a color term coral thrown in. So depending on where you live, similar colors have different names. And those names are based upon um, the dominant economic activities and the way that you produce your calories and what you eat and such. So in Georgia, you eat peaches. Across much of the South, you eat peaches. In the Pacific Northwest, you eat salmon, right? Um, in coastal areas that don't have salmon, you might collect bits of coral or you might uh, uh, go snorkeling on coral reefs, etc. So findings like this don't necessarily disprove the Sapir Wharf hypothesis. Um, or linguistic relativity, um, but 
these relationships between cultural features and then language argue against complete linguistic determinism, okay? That language is not limiting thought per se, that language doesn't solely determine the way that people think. So uh, for this next thinking critically about language, think about the slang that you use. How might the course slang that's used in daily conversations among college students, university students, teenagers, et cetera, be interpreted differently by parents or grandparents, right? Are there things that you say that your parents might take offense at um, or that your grandparents, and like you, you would maybe not say to your grandparents? Um, I mean, my mom doesn't like cursing, right? So if I were to drop an F-bomb, my mom would be just aghast. Uh, that would be, and, and specifically, like it really, 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 really bothers her if I curse around my teenagers, even though I know full well that my teenagers curse around their friends, right? Um, so slang like that, um, you know, there's the whole okay boomer thing right now. I've seen people both who are boomers and who aren't boomers get really upset by the okay boomer. You know, my students will sometimes say it to me and I'm like, well, okay, so I gotta be proud in my generation X, all right? I'm Gen X, we don't give a um, S-H-I-T, right? <clears throat> so um, I joke with them about it, but I've seen people in my own age get really offended that their students might think they're a baby boomer when really they're like 20 years away from being a baby boomer. Um, so, you think about the slang that you use, you think about the style of speech, you think about the, the euphemisms. Um, I, I'm trying to think of another example. Um, Gucci, right? Gucci to me refers to a specific designer by the last name of Gucci. So hearing things like Gucci gang and uh, hearing people describe like a situation as Gucci that took a little while for me to figure out what they meant. So you know, I'm constantly using my students to understand kind of urban dictionary type things and, uh, and teen speak um, so that I can use relative metaphors. Uh, use, I can use metaphors that actually are meaningful to them. Um, and you know, even their language arts professors tie that over like the, the um, my son's class this year did an, a unit on Shakespearean insults, right? So that's some fun is to find the list of Shakespearean insults and then try to use those on your friends. It's, but, you know, kind of doing an exercise where you recognize what the equivalent insult would be in a modern context. <clears throat> 